Well, it's a great honor and a pleasure to welcome to the show once again, Wilfred Riley, uh, Professor of Political Science at Kentucky State University. How are you today, Wilfred? And thank you again for joining this program. Yeah, glad, glad to be here, glad to be back and uh, doing, doing pretty well today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the school year is about to start. So are you uh, at all excited for that? I am actually, I mean, I, I enjoy teaching. So we have, I mean, in Kentucky for most of the past year plus, really, there's been fairly little COVID panic, if you will. I mean, we've been back in the classroom. But uh, right now, by this point, we're, we're fully running again. All my classes are in person, although obviously we've maintained some of the tech stuff that we picked up during the pandemic. I'm actually teaching a class at the local high school as well, which is hmm. interesting. We're doing an outreach program in the city itself and in surrounding kind of Appalachia and black communities as well. So some of the professors are kind of venturing out of field. I only have to go downtown, which is two minutes from me. So, but I'm enjoying it. It's a new, but very enthusiastic group of kids who are kind of excited about the chance to talk to these real college professors as opposed to actual college kids who are great, but you know, often hung over, tired, there at 9 a.m. and so on. So it's, it's a bit of a variance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I forgot to add in the introduction I just gave that you are one of uh, the U.S.'s most perceptive uh, commentator on race relations in your country. And I, I'm curious to ask whether, you know, that part of, you know, that the public intellectual life, the, the part where you comment about race, do you play in the, your academic life where you, do you do you include that in your uh, teachings? To some extent. I mean, I've, I've written pretty prominent books on some of these issues, and sometimes I'll assign a portion of a chapter. I, I don't make my students buy my book. I think it's tacky in general. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll definitely, I'll try to expand the debate to include people that I think it's almost necessary to have heard of, but that are often not very well known. I mean, in sort of younger academia, but I mean, Thomas Sowell's the obvious one. Mm -hmm. The people that are personal friends or acquaintances from 1776 Unites, for example, a Glenn Lowry or John McWhorter. I mean, for that matter, there are obvious perspectives like Charles Murray on the hereditarian side that you're going to run into in, in business or in graduate school that are almost entirely kept out of that kind of scholastic or undergrad curriculum. And I'll sometimes toss those in. But I mean, in reality, what the materials you have for a class on race relations are often going to be pretty set. I mean, you know, Harvard Business Review does diversity training work and that sort of thing. So I'll definitely include a, a broader range of perspectives, but I don't I actually get surprisingly little sort of feedback or blowback. I mean, some people know who I am. But I mean, the general attitude at a state university, much less an Ivy, would be, well, some of the some of the professors are fairly well known. Well, that's interesting. Let's see if this guy, you know, is competent at teaching. Let's see how much homework he assigns. I, I would assume that radical students, I would suppose, are probably a bit less likely to take some of my classes, mm -hmm. you know, in that kind of quantitative interplay of politics and business. So I've, I've never really got a kid who knew who I was and hated me, for example, or something like that. But in the... In the course as it is, I mean, a, a broader range of materials, but it's it's not focused really on me or my work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess uh, we are focusing on the more public part of uh, your thinking, which is uh, about race relations in America. And uh, the first question I would like to ask regarding this issue is, I think, uh, I think most Americans would know or instinctively know the answer to this, but I'm asking as a non-American on behalf of other non-Americans. Uh, why is American slavery, despite being over like more than 150 years ago, still a very contentious issue in American history and politics today? Well, I, I think there are a couple of reasons. I mean, one of the most obvious is just that there is still evidence of American slavery today. I mean, in that you have a large black community in the USA and the majority, obviously there are African and Caribbean exceptions and so on, but the 75 to 90% majority of American blacks are Eidos. I mean, American descendants of slaves. So if you're gonna give an honest discussion of American history, you have to throw in the history of slavery there. But there's, there's a secondary component to it, which again is that 
academia at the higher and secondary levels leans very, very far to the left. So there's often not a, not a warts and all, but a sort of almost all warts focus on the flaws of the USA, kind of in isolation from the flaws of other countries. So, I mean, when you mention that slavery existed in the United States and it's notable, I mean, we have blacks and whites whose ancestors fought each other, whose ancestors experienced oppression in the case of the black people. I mean, that, the same sort of thing would be true in virtually every new world country. I mean, obviously the reason there are people in the new world is that individuals, including black people who are not indigenous to the Americas, despite what uh, some lunatics might say. But I mean, people from the old world came to the new world and conquered it essentially. So there was mass conflict between the Spanish and Portuguese and the native Amerindians everywhere in South America. I mean, there was black slavery and in many cases, white slavery in the majority of these countries, white indentured servitude at the very least. I mean, the Caribbean, you, you find the same sort of thing, Jamaica, Barbados, Bahamas, you had slavery, Brazil, obviously one of the most famous slave states in history. So I think the second part of the American obsession with American slavery is that people who don't much like America spend a lot of time talking about our vices in this sort of weird vacuum. I mean, and as opposed to kind of rambling on, a good example of this would just be quantitative. I mean, the majority of American high school students, when this has been asked two or three different times, think the USA was alone in having slaves. <laughs> Or at very least that American slavery was uniquely brutal and harsh in the whole history of the world. And there's, there's really no argument for that. I mean, if you want to talk about what's called chattel slavery, I mean, the ownership of human beings, usually battle captives, basically just as property. I mean, that was a, that was a huge part of Greco-Roman civilization. I mean, a beautiful civilization, but it's impossible to ignore that. I mean, you had the literal gladiatorial arena in ancient Rome. One of the Greek islands was famous as a slaving post that could sell 10,000 slaves a day. Uh, later, Roman writers said that it operated for 800 years. I don't assume they were always at max capacity, but you can sort of do the math there on man's inhumanity to man. But I mean, the same thing, there's, there's nothing uniquely white about this. Uh, Arab slavery, West African slavery, Barbary slavery, where a million plus European whites were captured and sold to Muslim and black masters. I mean, new world black slavery. I mean, probably the most disturbing trade to me that I've read about was the Aztec trade, where the people surrounding the Mexica, the Aztec empire, were raided regularly. And slaves are sometimes made to work or used as sexual concubines, but they were also sacrificed and eaten. So, I mean, there was this entire nightmare tradition in the central region of Mexico. And you still see ghosts of it in boogeyman stories about kind of the Mexica coming, because when they did, they would kill your father and sell your mother as a slave concubine and then possibly eat you. I mean, so this is, and that's not at all an exaggerated description. So, I mean, this went on throughout history. I don't think most Americans are aware of the scope of uh, global slavery. And we're made very aware of slavery here in the USA. And that, that kind of, that duality, that contradiction here leads to a near obsession with the racialization of history, you might say. This is a kind of last point, but there's also, this ties into a bizarre focus, and bizarre in my opinion, in American social science right now, on the race and gender aspects of almost any question. So, I mean, if you look at a listing of, for example, the top PhD students in my field, political science, or in sociology, or something similar, and you read through kind of the dissertation topics, the methods are very good, but it's, uh, there's a, almost all of it is stuff like, gender roles in 16th century warfare and peace, so on down the line. So I, I think that the same kind of lens has been focused on American history. Um, there's a great deal more writing about slavery or about how historical black contributions led to our wealth today than there is about another topic of equivalent import, uh, the development of the transcontinental railroads or something like that, outside of at least the, the field of very specialist history. So you, you wind up with this picture where we talk about this a lot, we don't provide any context, and many people thus view slavery, historical racial conflict as kind of the defining feature of American history. I, I don't think in practice that that is true. I don't think that a very large chunk of American wealth came from pre-1865 feudal form slavery in the poorest region of the country. And I think pretty much any kind of quantitative analysis tells you this, it's just become 
a bit politically incorrect to do those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'm, I think much of uh, what you've said there was uh, outlined in great detail in a national, art, uh, national review article that was, you wrote and published earlier this year, which was in response to, I think, the publication of the book-length version of the 1619 project uh, created and edited by Nicole Hannah Jones and published by New, the New York Times. And I do remember um, her, uh, Miss Hannah Jones, uh, publishing a Twitter thread where she bought that particular National Review article and, and you know, I guess skimmed through your essay. And she, you know, for the most part, she was just making like mocking comments about that rather than, you know, engaging in it with great detail. Um, so of course that brings us to the uh, topic of the day, which is the 1619 project. So I guess um, without, without delving into the project as a whole, tell us about the significance of that year, uh, 1,619. Well, I mean, again, unless you're an American left-wing historian, I'm not sure there is uh, extraordinary significance to that year. So uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones' argument essentially is that 1619 was the first time African slaves came to the North American continent, or this has sometimes been phrased as the region that would become the United States, as I understand. Um, the one problem with this is just that that's not true. I mean, the Spaniards began conquering in the Americas in 1492. Th this isn't my field of expertise, but I mean, you know, Ponce de Leon and similar people had reached Florida, had reached the Gulf Coast in the 1500s. Uh, some of their, the people in these expeditions were slaves in the classic kind of captured warrior sense, black slaves. So, I mean, the, the argument that the, these were the first Africans in the New World isn't true. I mean, that's not true at several levels. The argument that these were the first black slaves in the New World, I mean, doesn't, doesn't seem to be true. You could also uh, discuss whether black indentures in 1619 really were slaves. I mean, my understanding is that that took some the legal system had to develop around slavery in the new world. Because in Western Europe as versus Eastern Europe or the Muslim world, there hadn't been many slaves. There'd certainly been serfs and peasants. I mean, most people weren't free until anywhere in the world until the modern era. But I mean, my understanding is that the slavery in the new world required kind of a rediscovery of the old Roman slave codes and people went to court asking when someone could become a slave, could Christians be enslaved? But the first slave master in the USA, as I recall, is in the 1620s or 1630s and was a black guy. Uh, the question came up of whether someone who'd been stuck in a long-term indenture contract could be released and the court just said, you know, ah, no. And so this person who was himself of African descent ended up as the owner of a slave, one of the first few <laughs> slaves in the United States. So, I mean, the, the 1619 claim ignores, I mean, Spanish pre-existing slavery. Obviously, of course, it ignores native slavery. That was a non-European thing, so no one really cares about it and on that side of the aisle. But it, it doesn't seem to accurately describe a lot of those relationships in early colonial, I guess you're talking about Maryland, this sort of area, Massachusetts. So I don't, I don't necessarily think there's extraordinary significance there at all. But the date that was seized on is, OK, this is when these black people, I guess this is when black people who would become slaves arrived in the region of North America that would become the English speaking USA fairly early on. That's that's probably the intended significance. And as I understand, the, the 1619 drafting began in 2019. So the idea is that 400 years of slavery have taken place. So you weren't necessarily, I, the authors of the project weren't necessarily looking for a lot of complicators there. I mean, in reality, if you wanna break this down into different kind of temporal zones, the, the 400 years claim again is not very plausible. I mean, we, we haven't had slavery since 1865. So, I mean, that, that's 155 years of relative freedom in the black community, of course, significant oppression during much of that time. But it's also worth noting at the other end that there wasn't a United States in 1619. There's no particular reason to focus on brutality in the British exploitation colonies and not the Spanish exploitation colonies, really. I mean, the entire USA at this point was an exploited colonial possession. We fought a particularly brutal revolution against the British. I mean, both sides were paying bounties on scalps 
to get free from British colonialism, as many countries have around the world. So we weren't on a country until 1781. The actual time frame for American slavery is thus, you know, it's 1781 to 1865, or maybe a year earlier when Lincoln read the Emancipation Proclamation. And that's, that's certainly unfortunate, 80 plus years. But there's a big difference between that and 400 or 500 years. But that, that is the, out, the framework I've just given there is why the date matters, uh, I would say, to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm curious to know about, you know, uh, the background of uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones. Uh, who was she before she created this project? Uh, I wonder if you search into it. Um, well, again, other than, you know, casual online rival. I, I haven't spent a great deal of time investigating Nicole Hannah-Jones. I'm more interested in the accuracy of her writing than her background. But I mean, my understanding is that Nicole Hannah-Jones, and I don't, I'm, for those listening, because we both have a pretty large audience, I'm not really even saying this mockingly, but isn't a historian per se. Uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones is a journalist uh, degree from, bachelor's degree, if I recall correctly, from Notre Dame, who's become pretty well known for writing about race issues. And this this goes back into college. I mean, as I recall, she had some embarrassing kind of Ibram Kendi style pieces of the R. White's really human variety when she was a, a student writer. And she then went on to a series of, you know, different publications, finally wound up at the New York Times and has kind of a cushy deal with the Times from all I've ever been able to tell. I mean, she seems to file a couple of pieces a year, mostly dealing with race relations issues and work on her own writing the remainder of the time. But uh, yeah, journalist at the standard BA level. I don't, I don't think Nicole Hannah-Jones has an academic background. She may have a master's. Uh, right now, she is a professor. She was hired by, I believe, North Carolina in a weird situation where she ended up suing them for not immediately granting her tenure, saying that she was being insulted as a black woman and a trailbreaker. Um, again, her personal work life is not my business, but professors are not generally granted tenure. Um, so, I mean, you, you have that weird contrast between obviously being treated unusually nicely, which is not uncommon with these people. I mean, Ibram Kendi, another occasional online sparring partner, recently got a, what is it, $10 million grant up there at uh, Boston U. And you know, good luck to anyone pursuing granting funds, but that's the idea that you could talk seriously about experiencing disproportionate amounts of racism while people are just sort of giving you money for complaining about racism is funny to me. And I think it's probably even funnier to many white and Asian Americans that have not had this, uh, this disadvantage. But that's, uh, that, that's NHJ right now. She is um, working at UNC. The, the lawsuit was resolved. UNC committed to give her tenure, pay her, I think, $75,000 and train 30 people in how to better interact with diverse employees. So um, she is she's settling in there, but a BA in journalism by background. Right. Um, I know that she's uh, she had a few lectures as a uh, in, in the website masterclass, and that was part of a compendium of, uh, I guess, uh, Black is intellectuals and professionals uh, giving you their perspectives on race. Uh, I know that John McWhorter has a few lectures in there as well, and, but for the most part, I do remember her and her bright red hair um, lecturing you about, I guess, the overwhelming legacy of slavery. So um, my reading of uh, Project 1619, which uh, I guess surprising to no one, won the Pulitzer Prize, is that it seeks to revise how we, Americans and non-Americans alike, uh, look at American history. And, it, and it, it purports to explain or rewrite American history primary on, primarily on the lens of well, race, or especially American slavery. I know that uh, Ibram X. Kendi also contributed an essay in the book version of the project and it purports that everything that they, uh, very left-wing people, see as bad in America as a part of slavery, like as a legacy of slavery, part of the legacy of slavery, and everything that's good or they find good about America is, 
is the effort of uh, Black Americans who, who were previously enslaved. Yes. Uh, well, I, I hope that's an accurate or fairly accurate summary. Um, and my question now is that to what extent is this project, which I find to be either bad history or bad journalism or both, comparable to Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States, uh, released probably two or three decades ago? Well, it's exactly comparable. I mean, I talk about both of them in my own upcoming book, which I'm sure has a center-right bias, but which is called something like The New Lies Your Teacher's Been Telling You. I mean, it is kind of a fairly direct response to the Zen sort of the lies the schools told you literature that came out in the late 80s, early 90s. The argument there was against kind of the jingoist patriotic curricula that a kid might have might have gotten growing up in the 50s, 60s, early 70s in America. And they make the points, I mean, uh, like I've read Vine Deloria's um, books on Native Americans, you know, they make the points that there were a good number of Native Americans, for example. Uh, the whites killed them in a series of bloody wars. I mean, I, if you hadn't learned this stuff, there might have been some useful information in that book. Zen actually is an old school Marxist, and he's pretty good on labor history. I mean, so in the USA, we do tend to forget that we had robber barons here on par with the nobility of Europe by the middle of the later part of the 19th century. And it took coordinated action for people to get things like basic working wages and factories, blah, blah, blah. So if you hadn't heard any of this, I mean, I think that you might have picked up some useful information from these books. But all in all, I, they're not what I would consider to be serious scholarship. Uh, 1619, at least in many places, certainly is not. The goal is sort of telling a story from your political side's vantage point or point of view. Uh, Zen's been pretty open about this. Uh, in my book, for example, I, I point out, and again, try to be as unbiased as possible, but I point out that it's just as easy to tell the same stories in reverse and criticize kind of the new dishonesty of the woke left. I mean, so for example, um, one of my chapters is called Native Americans Weren't Peaceful. And it just describes what Mesoamerica in particular was like before white people got there. You know, humans tend to be deplorably human everywhere in the world. Another chapter looks at the quote unquote red scare and points out that if you look at what are called the Venona cables in my field of political science, declassified in 1995, almost everyone we accused of being a Russian spy was a Russian spy. I mean, so that's a small detail when it comes to, you know, the Rosenbergs or Alger Hiss or something that it seems like every textbook should include. Most do not. But at any rate, um, scholarship can obviously and scholarship can obviously come from any point on the political spectrum. 1619 clearly comes from the fairly hard left. And the goal is essentially what you said. Uh, describing every positive feature of American society as the result of the contributions of Blacks and almost every negative feature of American society as a downstream result of slavery. And they're pretty open about this. I mean, I took some notes on core 1619 claims. I mean, Nicole Hannah-Jones has said, for example, virtually everything unique about the United States came out of slavery. Um, the Revolutionary War was fought in large part to keep Black people enslaved. That's probably the most famous of these in terms of people just calling it out and saying that's absolute nonsense. I mean, the British had overseas slavery until 1833. But I mean, you know, the, the majority, I, yeah, I think it's fair to say they say the majority of America's wealth descends downstream from slavery. Slavery or racism is in the blood of the USA. So these very bold sweeping claims are made. And I think we've both summed them up pretty well. The question, I guess, would be at some level, are those accurate? And I mean, the, the short answer is no. Um, this kind of thing has become so prevalent in academia and in kind of quasi academia, highbrow media and so on, that a lot of people have gotten used to hearing it. So we'll just almost as a default say things like, well, yes, Blacks built this country. But the reality is that, I mean, slavery historically was concentrated in the poorest region of the USA, and it included about 11 or 12 percent of the population of the country. So I think that as a black man, you can definitely admire those ancestors who kind of kept going, maintained surprisingly stable families, so on in the face of this brutal oppression, without saying, well, you know, this this 10 percent of the population in the 
the most deprived region of the country is responsible for everything we see today. I mean, if you actually look at US national GDP, um, I estimate this in a recent argument article for Real Clear Policy. I don't, I don't have the, you know, my stator right in front of me, but it's up something like 176,000% since the end of the Civil War. Now, obviously you have to adjust to keep that in constant dollars, but it, this historical slavery was not the thing responsible for Asian immigration beginning in the 1960s or the tech boom or any of the things that have led to a lot of modern American success. So I, I think what you have there is a desire almost to provide cope or to provide explanations to say whenever anyone's discussing what different groups have contributed to this country, well, what my group contributed was everything. <laughs> and I think just as just as when you've seen these arguments from white supremacists or Irishmen writing these books, there's a book in the published in the 1800s called something like an Irishman was there. And it's just every every historical event is retold from the perspective of an Irish American soldier in the war of 18 whatever. And the reality is that that is not an accurate presentation of history. And I don't, I don't think this is either. I mean, obviously there are many great black contributors to US history, but there also are, I mean, there are real histories by, uh, I believe it's John Wood, you know, Tom Soule's written on this. You can, you can simply go to any history book before about 1895 and look at their descriptions of the South. And the general perspective was that slavery, the sort of agrarian surf system retarded the development of the South pretty dramatically. I mean, at the time of the Civil War, the South had more than a quarter of the free population of the USA, but about 10% of the physical plant. It's one of the major reasons that they lost the war. Um, everything had to be built from scratch. There, there wasn't a sort of Bessemer process steel and iron producing industry. So one had to be built, I believe it was the Trafalgar Iron Works. Um, you had to build new sources of gun and firearms production to counter those in the North and so on down the line. None of that existed in the South. And a lot of that was because of the plantation nature of the South. So if you're gonna really look at the impact of slavery, I mean, you certainly can look at the output produced by slaves themselves, but you also can compare slave and free regions and see kind of what would have been possible without slavery, which is historically a lag on countries. I mean, when you look at Brazil, Haiti, other large scale slave states, you're not necessarily seeing, without getting too into the blah, 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 countries that are far richer than countries that never had slaves. Uh, Singapore comes to mind, at least in the modern era you know, the Netherlands. So I'd have to look at what each of those did overseas, but you know, slavery within the homeland is not a producer of wealth. Yeah, um, yeah, I think two key takeaways you can, uh, I think two key takeaways uh, we can. Uh, Come on with this, sorry, that's some of the noise you're hearing. There's a small airport uh, nearby, it's the state capital airport. So the governor is probably hosting an event today or something. Okay. There, there are these small planes and helicopters flying by. Mm -hmm. But all right, uh, sorry, what, what was the question? Yeah, uh, sorry, uh, as I was saying before, uh, the surprise appearance of uh, airplane, an airplane. Um, two key takeaways we can take, we can, you know, receive from uh, your article in National Review, as well as this uh, discussion, is that um, slavery was not a unique American institution. It's it's very, very much a universal until the abolitionists uh, won the moral argument. And even then, even today, there is still slavery uh, across some parts of the world. Um, I know that Coleman Hughes in that song, he mentions uh, Mauritania as a land that still has slaves. And secondly, um, you know, unlike uh, Hannah Jones and Coe's uh, claim that uh, the regime of American capitalism, the free market capitalism that uh, fuels American progress and prosperity is a direct result of American slavery. In reality, uh, slave states in the South are for the most part ag ag agrarian or agrarian and they, they are not as successful or as prosperous as the Northern free states, which have for the most part embraced the free market production model. Um, 
But um, just a quick, another quick question before we move on to the 70, 1776 Unites. Uh, how did the how did the sixteen nineteen ers view Abraham Lincoln? Well, they have a fairly negative view. Uh, well. Yeah, that's, I think it's fair to say they have a fairly negative view of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I would have to, before, I, I try never just to say bullshit because I do a lot of interviews and the temptation is ever present. Uh, I would have to reread 1619 on Abe Lincoln to distinguish everything they've said about Honest Abe from what's been said in that more general, I think of a sort of fake history zone, but that zone of revisionist history from the left. The general perspective on Honest Abe from the revisionist left is that Abraham Lincoln was kind of a scumbag. Um, people will generally pull up some of his comments. For example, if it could save the Union absent war, I would not see one slave freed, um, many of which were made almost as generalities. At that point, it was obvious that this would not occur. But I mean, uh, Lincoln's support for colonialization is noted. What that means in context is that he wanted to take Black Americans and send them back to Africa, essentially with arms and ships to establish countries. That's how Liberia was set up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't, I don't think by our standards today, those are ideal positions to hold. But I also think that one of the biggest mistakes you can make when you're actually doing real history, which is something I'm interested in, at least as a sideline, is this kind of silly anachronistic thinking. I mean, the reality is that the moral morals are not objectively real in most cases, with a few exceptions, like the prohibitions against cannibalism and child rape and so on, that do tend to be pretty sweeping. But I mean, in almost every case, it's pretty stupid to judge people in one era by the moral standards of another era. I mean, a very good example of this would be that a European or American gentleman, or I'm sure, Vietnamese or Chinese gentlemen of uh, Abe Lincoln's time would view most modern American women as whores. And I don't, I don't say that just to be like mocking and funny. I mean, in the literal sense of like, you're on OnlyFans, you are having gentlemen pay you for sex. You are an actual prostitute. And I mean, for whatever reason, we seem to become comfortable with that. Like I, I was recently out with the guys and we were talking about this and all of us are kind of mid to late thirties. So we're mostly in stable relationships or married. But I mean, one of the younger guys was asking, like, would you have a girlfriend who had an OnlyFans account? And about half the guys said yes, half the guys said no. But it was an interesting question. Like, would you have a girlfriend who's an active sex worker? I mean, like, she's not necessarily sleeping with the guys, but who's managing this video stream, doing all this stuff. And again, we're at a point now where American male opinions differ on that. And throughout virtually all of history, this would be seen as just open prostitution. It would have been dramatically against the law. The point is not that OnlyFans should be shut down and everyone on the site arrested, but that these cross time frame comparisons don't make a lot of sense. I mean, when you're talking about someone in 1863, considering the question of slavery, in 1863, it was almost universally accepted that if you lost a war, for example, you might spend some time as a slave. Uh, slavery existed throughout the Arab world. I don't need to go through the whole litany again, but I mean, it just... We, the reason that the phrase shores of Tripoli is in the Marine Corps hymn in the United States is that less than 70 years before that, we fought a war against the Barbary pirates, who were, by the way, mostly black and Muslim, but who were slavers as a national model, who were settled in large islands off the North African coast, and who would essentially raid any ships passing by and grab the people on them to sell as slaves or as servants. And I mean, we, we were offended by this. We attacked the, the core islands and essentially told them they couldn't do this to Americans, but as I recall, we didn't stop them doing it to Frenchmen or anyone else. This was, this was just sort of how the game was played at the time. So Lincoln saying the things he did might offend us today, but I don't think morally besmirches himself as a guy in the 1800s. And this is becoming especially funny as the feminists now look at the early heroes of the left. So, I mean, Martin Luther King is taking a bunch of criticism today about his attitudes toward women. I mean, he apparently participated in sex parties and joked about women, his, you know, virtue. At one point, he actually, in response to a letter, told a young black homosexual man, black gay man, a whole bunch of brutal stuff you might consider therapy. You've got to get rid of this weird perversion you have. So, I mean, if you take modern dorm room attitudes toward sex work, toward homosexuality, toward transgenderism, I mean, 
not to put that entirely in quotes, but the modern non-binary movement and so on, those attitudes would not have been common anywhere in the world until about 30 years ago. But regardless of this, this fact being true in reality, uh, the answer is that most people who are on the academic left don't like Abe Lincoln. Um, the, one of the things here, and this is, this is kind of my last comment on this, but one thing that you have to understand, and I think you do understand, is that to an actual Marxist, and many of these people like Patrice Colores from BLM have openly described themselves as communist or as trained Marxist, whatever, that's not just a right-wing calumny, but to a Marxist, almost every problem is the result of capitalism, right? It's the result of misdistributions of capital within these systems that create alienated labor and false consciousness. I mean, everyone should read through the Marxist dialectic and see what these people say. But the problem with this, to quote my first quantitative instructor, is that it's wrong. I mean, you can empirically look at the countries of the world and look at present or past communist countries and test whether there's been less environmental degradation, racism, sex work, serfdom, so on down the line. And when you look at countries like Russia or China, I mean, great human civilizations, but the answer to the question of is there less sex work or serfdom? No, I mean, obviously not. There, there's more objectively, Cuba. Um, and the response generally of the communist when you say this is just, oh, well, that wasn't real communism. But at some point it has to be, right? I mean, when you go through every example, Cambodia tried this, India tried this, these great sophisticated civilizations. I mean, from you know the Khmer to the Ruski to South India, it always failed, why? Well, they got it wrong too. I mean, I personally think that there's, there's almost a comedy routine there, but the basic reality is Hannah Jones and her team strike me as having pretty much this attitude that most faults are capitalist faults and also a tendency to label most of our leaders in any given era as bad people by using the standards of today. So all this, all this goes into the project, but the, the end goals of the project are what you described earlier. I mean, everything good comes from black people, everything bad comes from slavery involving black people. Yeah, yeah a few things there. I'm, I mean, I'm, I, I was born and raised in Vietnam, so I, I know Marxist like theory and practice a bit all too well and uh, you know one thing that you one thing that you would say regarding uh, communist regimes is that every newly established one seeks to outdo the one before it in terms of their adherence to authentic Marxist principles like uh, the Soviet Union China and Cuba and then Cambodia and then of course uh, my own uh, particular country. Um, and one thing about Abe Lincoln and Martin Luther King is that I, you know, we have both been very much inspired by the rhetoric and the immense work that these two individuals have done to advance the human condition in general. And I'm not very surprised at the fact that they may have said something objectionable, uh, either in passing or, you know, uh or on or, or you know seriously uh, but i am very much surprised and um uh, and you know and floored at the fact that they have said something they've said many things that are still to this day inspirational and resonating and that is uh yeah they have a rare gift that not many of us have like how many people at a Lincoln's time can say things that are inspirational to us today. So uh, as an aside, I do look forward to that uh, new book of yours, which uh, aims to dispel uh, left, left wing myths about uh, American history. Uh, what's the working title of that one? Uh, 12 Lies Your Liberal Teacher Told You. It's, it's a, just kind of a direct taunt at the, uh, the original book. Ah, I see. Yes, I look forward to this one. Uh, and of course, uh, let's talk about uh, 1776 Unites. Uh, of course, it's a much more common year to the American conscious is where, you know, America, the country, the idea of America as a country was actually born. And um, it was uh, formed uh, in, by various, uh, the who's who's of, I guess, Black conservatism. You yourself are involved in that. Uh, it was founded by uh, one Robert Woodson uh, Sr. 
a great uh, civil rights leader and community uh, organizer or advocate. I hesitate to use uh, the word community organizer because it has a left-wing taint to it. But um, yeah, tell me about the project as a whole. What, uh, what, is it, uh, what is it mission statement? Sure, yeah. First, just a brief comment on what you said before, because I think this is important. You're absolutely right that Lincoln and MLK sometimes said offensive things. And although this wouldn't be my focus if I were teaching a course on MLK scholarship, sure, we should look into those. That's that's the role of a historian. A feminist historian might, might have some work to do there. But the reason that we honor Lincoln and MLK is that they did these remarkably great things. So everyone, and this sounds almost cliche, but everyone is imperfect. We honor, the, so by definition, anyone we honor will be imperfect. We honor imperfect people that do great or significant things. That's an extraordinarily simple statement, but it's fairly important. So, I mean, you know, Thomas Jefferson had a sexual affair with Sally Hemings. And I, this is often presented very uncharitably as this, this is just a series of brutal rapes. The reality is that concubinage, again, around the world is something that has an extremely long tradition with people having a mistress who's technically an enslaved person or a servant girl or something like that. And they're, they're iffy questions of consent. But in many cases, these people were very much in love with one another, reading through Roman tradition and so on down the line. Same thing in Persia, India. But at any rate, I mean, so that is a thing that happened and we can talk about you know how happy jefferson's domestic affairs were but that's not why we're building statues to fucking tom jefferson jefferson was one of the founding fathers of the united states he wrote the constitution so it's one thing to say well this guy was an imperfect man or perhaps he was a sexual dog this guy had had his issues he also drank too much but especially the latter of those that's true for a huge percentage of people many most rich men in jefferson's time had slaves Many people today are sexually imperfect or alcoholics. The reason that we do not construct statues to these people is that they didn't start the United States. So this isn't a particularly difficult distinction to make in practice. We're not building statues to MLK because he cheated on his wife, allegedly. We're building statues to MLK because he, along with Kennedy and Johnson, passed the U.S. Civil Rights Act and averted a potential race war. So it's, I think you summed this up quite well, but it, it's important to recognize that, that we honor people for the work that they've performed, assuming that they weren't too morally deviant versus the standards of their time. We don't honor them for being morally perfect. A good example of this, and I'll get, I'll get to your second question, but I mean, Mahatma Gandhi, it now appears, was an egregious racist. I find this funny, oh, yeah. especially because he didn't, he didn't hurt anybody. You know? but he was just a huge bigot. He didn't like mm -hmm. black people. He didn't like what he called Britishers. He has all this ranting about blacks and sometimes whites as versus Indians. This has been uncovered over the past couple of years. And people sometimes ask me, what, how does this affect your view of Gandhi in terms of the monuments and so on? And it, my answer is it affects it not at all. Gandhi's being honored because he achieved a largely peaceful Indian transition away from Britain. I mean, imagine the bloodshed of that conflict potentially. That's why we have the statutes. Of, I mean, and of course there's an element of image there. Gandhi was a lawyer. He didn't actually go walking around and loincloths and so on the majority of the time, but all of the personal stuff, all of the conflict in his life doesn't change what occurred in India or what occurred as re-Britain or something like that. So do I view Gandhi as a great man still? Yes. The idea that people have imperfections but can achieve noble things was extraordinarily obvious to virtually everyone outside of the monastic life until kind of the rise of a different sort of church lady on the left. I think that's interesting. Now, uh, 1776 unites. Thanks for, thanks for shouting that group out. But 1776 Unites began as the Black kind of business and social science community. I don't really think we're all conservative, but yeah, business and heterodox social science community, at least, response to the 1619 Project. Um, when I and others started looking through the claims of 1619, a lot of them seemed like the Revolutionary War thing to verge on the ludicrous. Like, I mean, these were, these were arguments that obviously weren't true. And you were sort of seeing this kind of clapping seals routine from white liberals. And it's often very patronizing, right? Like, oh yeah, you know, like the, all the wealth of the USA came from slaves in 1860. Like you, you work in tech, you know, that's not true. Uh, so there's a lot of this going on. And we decided to meet 
and draft what became the book uh, Red, White, and Black, which was the number one bestseller for quite a while, uh, set up an NGO, do a couple things in response. And the core thesis of 1776, I think Bob Woodson said it best, actually, um, racism existed in the past, to some extent exists today, but it's simply not very difficult to succeed in the USA as a hardworking, normal citizen, and our focus should be on how to do this, as opposed to kind of telling lies about the past. And the reason that they keep telling lies about the past is strategic, it's situational. The goal is explaining struggles in Black communities today, by and large, if you're looking at the Black side of this. I would argue that the same thing is true for a lot of the feminist theory, a lot of the poor white union stuff. I mean, you rarely see someone who's a very happy, well-adjusted person indulging in these arguments or in any other sort of endless excuse making. But I mean, the, so the 1619 claim is, you know, if you look at fatherlessness, for example, something they touch on tangentially, that's the legacy of slavery, lower test scores, legacy of slavery, the legacy of slavery is in everything. Why do we eat so much sugar in the USA? Slavery. Why do we have traffic jams in Southern cities? Slavery. And while we're fixing the harms of slavery, let's not forget that black people are also responsible for everything good. So, you know, sport, food, art, so on down the line. And the reality is that while this is a convenient excuse narrative, it's not very useful in terms of, of getting anywhere. So 1776, the focus is on many of these claims of racism are not real. And our interest is in emboldening and making more possible success. And the secondary element there is how do you do that? Um, when you examine a lot of this stuff, like just black fatherlessness is a good example. What you find is that there's a three part problem with the claim that this is simple and racism caused. Part one is just when there was much more ethnic conflict, when whites, blacks, natives were often literally at one another's throat with weapons, these problems didn't exist. I mean, if you go back to 1938, uh, the great black conservative scholar Walter Williams pegged the black out of wedlock birth rate at 11%. Uh, whites were doing even better, it was 4%. But I mean, this, this simply wasn't a problem for anyone. I mean, I would assume Asians, Hispanics, natives were all about in that range, 2%, 5%, 7%. But no group, I mean, we were considered a bit disgraceful because we were over 10%. No group came close to 12, 15% illegitimacy. Almost all families were stable. So, I mean, this is problem one with the 1619 narrative, this sort of endless subtle racism is, is causing these issues. This is also the Ibram Kendi narrative, Robin D'Angelo narrative. It's the white gaze, it's white fragility, it's something out there in the system. I don't think it is. I think it's pretty easily explainable variables that I'm gonna to get to in a second. But I mean, point two of the problem with, with this narrative is that minority immigrants don't seem to have these problems. Like groups that face extraordinary bigotry, like right now in the USA, we have a problem with anti-Asian hate attacks mm -hmm. where people often black, sometimes white, will literally grab Asian community elders and do things like hit them over the head with fire extinguishers. Like the videos are disturbing to watch, their whole channel's devoted to these. Asian Americans are currently one of the most successful groups in the country. You know, Indian Americans are the most successful group in the country. Nigerian Americans who are black, who are literally from the motherland, are the best educated, most academic group in the country. So on down the line. So when you look at illegitimacy rates in Nigerian communities, they're virtually non-existent. Why does the magic racism not affect these literal black Africans? Um, I mean, then you go to point three. Many of the problems today that are attributed by a Ken DeAngelis, by a 1619 author, to prejudice also exist for working class whites, which is a group no one cares about that's studied you know, relatively infrequently. But if you come here to Kentucky, the out of wedlock birth rate for poor whites is around 50%. So you, you have to look at all these questions, like why didn't this happen in the past when we actually were fighting each other? Why doesn't this happen ever to Asians and Nigerians today? And why does it happen to poor whites to the exact same extent that it does to blacks? And that, that points to a very different picture. So it, it, in 1776, we focus on some obvious things like the success sequence that are actually more likely to produce positive results than the narrative that we keep hearing about. And a, a final comment here, something very dangerous in the social science is theory that's been proven false, but that endures. So that's, that's the thing with Marxism, actually. I mean, like, Marxism is a dialectic testable theory. 
and there are a whole bunch of predictions that come out of Marxism. For example, people will choose to ally with their social class as versus their nation, race, or religion during times of intense conflict. And these, that's one that comes to, obviously to mind to me as a political scientist. But these predictions have been proven wrong over and over and over again. Why do people continue to cling to Marxism? Well, because it sounds like it might be right. It sounds like an intelligent, theoretical versus merely random explanation for the world. The only problem is that it doesn't work. But because it sounds like it might, every generation, more people are drawn to this, more people try the same failed ideas again, and you know, more people suffer and die as a result. At, at a much lower, less serious level, I think the, the theory that all group gaps are explained by bias is another obviously inaccurate theory that produces illogical down road predictions and behaviors. Like if you actually think that you're gonna do a whole bunch of things like turning up the focus on DEI training or minimizing standardized testing that'll have exactly the opposite result from what you want. So kind of got a, a bit a field there, but um, that is 1776 versus 1619. I see. Well, uh, just to add, you know, um... I know that Nathan Glazer is a, an acclaimed sociologist uh, in okay. the U.S. Even though you know he his work may not be as uh, popular in universities as he should, and uh, I think in the year '65, right, he um, came out with a book called Beyond the Melting Pot, which uh, thoroughly demolished the Marxist claim that you know you ally with someone of your own social class because in the racially diverse New York City. Um, people who are of the same working class background, but who are separated by different ethnic ethnicities often uh, engage in conflict. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, yes. I mean, Mark, the, I actually don't think theory is all that important at all. This is, this is something that would be radically controversial in like the academic social sciences, but then in business analytics, one of the other fields I've worked in would just be taken as kind of common sense. I have sort of a, what I would call a Kip Schools ex Weiss, like the guy who discovered certain forms of bacterial life, view of theory. Um, in that what you theorize should come from observed reality. So when I run sort of a business regression where I don't have to ethically put in a complex theoretical model, um, I don't really p-hack or anything. I, I just put the data in and actually run a, a regression analysis. I look at you know, the dependent variable and then what affects it? And it's often not what you'd expect. It's often, this is not an occasional outlier. I don't think I'm some unique genius. It's very often something that hasn't been theorized much about because conditions change. So I think if you're actually looking at something like what predicts success in the USA, I mean, you find a whole range of things that go from the obvious to the unexpected. I mean, one of the clearest predictors of life success is just IQ. But another one is region. Um, We've seen dramatic intra-country shifts in the USA recently. I just wrote this down for an essay, actually, but almost all recent population growth has been concentrated in the West and in the urban South. So since 1970, the Northeast, which we think of as kind of the core region of the country for whatever reason, grew 3.2%. The Midwest, Chicago and all that, grew 5.6%. And the West grew, I think, 26%. So your willingness, you're living in a region where there are jobs or your willingness to transit and move to work a job is, is a big predictor of success. Uh, your age, if you're looking at income, uh, we talked about this one because it's just so, so obvious and so often ignored. But I mean, if you're talking about income or wealth or you're talking about the black, white income and wealth gaps, I mean, it, it's notable that the most common age for a black guy is 27 and the most common age for a white guy is 58. That doesn't close the whole gap. It generally doesn't close more than half of it, if that. But I mean, that, that's a damn significant contribution. And just on and on down the line. So if you're actually interested in what predicts success, you can literally just run a model with the dependent variable income and look at what predicts income. And then think about whether it's plausible that racism affects these independent variables that actually have this effect. And if not, what does? I'm a big fan of kind of Amy Chua's uh, idea of, if I pronounce that correctly, Chua, but it's uh, of sort of the, the success sequence or the immigrant advantage that what's going to make you successful in life is fairly obvious stuff 
that is, you know, positive outcome predicting. I mean, so she does IQ, she does EQ, how emotionally well you interact with people. She does grit, how hard you work. And obviously, I don't think that, I mean, I don't think any of these, since I'm on the culturalist side of the culturalist hereditary and IQ debate, but certainly most of these are not substantially genetically influenced at the group level. I don't think anyone honestly thinks, say, Scotsmen are lazy in today's conversation, this kind of thing. But nonetheless, like groups where this stuff is culturally taught or who receive infusions of it from something like a charter school network are going to do pretty well. And that seems like a much better predictor of why, for example, Vietnamese Americans succeed than they don't experience racism. And in fact, that they don't experience racism kind of borders on the offensive, where like you'll go on your computer and you'll see these groups of black dudes, and white dudes kicking Asian guys. And then you'll see this weird, this weird argument that Asians are, what is it, white adjacent? Mm -hmm. Their Asian success is due to the fact that people think of Asians as Caucasian. And th that seems objectively nonsensical at a time of pretty significant conflict between these three groups. It's something else. But if you're wedded to the theory, you'll never consider the something else. Yeah, um, you know, on that point, and... Uh... You know, you and I both love hip hop music, and but I do find that some of the most like popular artists in today's hip hop world make songs that really fetishize Asian women. And there's that um, there's that one discussion with um, Jada Pinkett Smith, right, Will Smith's wife, as well as her mom, where her mother, where her mother complains about how there are too much uh, Korean nail salon beauty store employees. And they don't pay her no respect uh, to quote her, and you know, and it it apparently uh, just like how last time we talked about how you know black people's attitudes towards women in general are for the most part overlooked by feminists of the liberal sort. Uh, black people's attitudes towards uh, Asians, you know, not not all of them, but you know, prominently featured in the culture and all that. Uh, for the most part, overlooked by, I guess, liberal people behind the 1619 project and and uh, those occupying academia and all that. Um, you know, uh, in to continue on the topic of 1619 unites and all that. I'm I used the phrase uh, "black conservative" uh, to I guess as a description of a, I guess a a group of a cohort of black intellectuals and journalists and activists who may may or may not be you know on the conservative side i know that john mcwhorter as well as coleman hughes identify themselves as liberals but they along with you know you would be uh lumped in with the umbrella of black conservative because um here's what i find i, I actually saw that film documentary film uncle tom that was released really okay. A year or two ago, uh, what I make of it is that you know people who are identified as black conservative, either self-identified or otherwise, they have no illusions about you know America's dark and brutal history in regards to its black population and the slavery and the Jim Crow era and the civil rights movement and all that. Some of them even lived through uh, Jim Crow in the 1960s. Bob Pusson being an example, but nevertheless, they maintain an exceptional level of patriotism. They still believe in the foundational message uh, and the founding ethos of the US of A as a whole. Um, so, but still they are, they are labeled or, you know, pejoratively as Uncle Tom's. And of course uh, we know, you know, we Vietnamese know about the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, where the titular character is a, uh, you know, gentle-minded uh, slave who gave his own life at the end of the book. But uh, I, I like to, I like for you to explain how Uncle Tom is being used as a slur against, um, I guess, black people who do not adhere to the liberal orthodoxy, because uh, you know, I think that's a misreading of the. The character at first but yeah please elaborate yeah so 
I, I think, first of all, the phrase black conservative is kind of an interesting one, because, I mean, if you look at the masthead for 1776 Unites, it brings together people like, as you mentioned, Coleman, uh, John McWhorter, who by any normal standard or kind of New York Times reading, you know, latte sipping liberal. I mean, I think Thomas Chatterton Williams has done some work with us. These are all great guys, but I mean, the turtleneck sweater owning uh, brigade is well represented. And they, uh, but I mean, then you swing over to the real conservatives. I mean, Republican party stalwarts like Carol Swain, Bob Woodson, you know, and Brooks Brothers suits talking to the Heritage Foundation. I mean, I myself am a center right businessman. I mean, we're probably the majority black Jason Hill and those guys. But I mean, when you say all of these people would be united in the minds of, say, Ibram Kendi as black conservatives, I think what a black conservative is, is someone who rejects the kind of Kendi X1619 narrative, which can be spelled out very explicitly as all gaps in performance between large groups are due to racism. Kendi said this over and over. The argument from Kendi or Jones or maybe Derek Bell back in the day is pretty simple. It's actually elegant, even though it's wrong, but it's sort of the only two possible explanations for a gap in performance are inferiority. They often use the word deep set. I think they mean genetic or uh, some kind of prejudice that's stopping one of the groups from performing. The just for those who haven't heard me yet before, the counter is actually extremely simple, that large groups that differ in terms of experiences with racism and potentially in terms of genetics also differ in terms of region, which we've just discussed, culture, uh, which we haven't discussed, but is the most significant of these, you know, past history. So are we talking about racism in the past or the present? And just sort of plain stochastic or luck-based variables like age. So in fact, it would be ridiculous to assume that all of these large groups that differ in terms of these four to six characteristics would wind up at the finish line at the same time for most things. Thomas Sowell once famously and amusingly pointed out that 60% of Italian chefs are Italian. <laughs> and I would assume that's true across a bunch of fields that, you know, quote unquote, brothers and rednecks from the South who come from a more working class culture you know, who come from a, a very athletic culture who migrated to the North where there was less competition would be very likely to dominate in sports like football. And in fact, that's what you see. You see both of those groups, especially the black guys, massively overrepresented. There's no real logical reason to assume that another group of people that perhaps had some slight physical differences versus the two I mentioned, but more importantly, who played less football, came from a more upper class background, indulged in different activities like soccer and tennis that they would do as well on the football pit there's no football field there's no reason to think that that would be the case so the the core argument is clearly wrong but it, it it is popular and a black conservative is simply someone who opposes that argument who points out that large groups clearly differ in terms of you know regional cultural historical systematic and stochastic variables um so, I mean, like many black conservatives would point out the obvious, like if you're talking about school performance, scholastic performance, you know, there may be some mild bias on the part of teachers, although I will note blacks are overrepresented among early educators. There's there's no evidence of this. There seems to be more bias against Asian kids and they do fine. But sure, we'll concede that there's a 3% level of bias against black students, but we're behind by 20%. Why? And there, there's some obvious things that suggest themselves, like the fact that we study about half as much as white and Asian kids do. So the problem, and by the way, Southern working class whites study about as much. Again, there, there's no gene for reading the algebra textbook, but I mean, there certainly is a cultural predictor for it. If you come from the working class in the South, especially if you're black, you're probably gonna have had less experience with that. And you're gonna have to be taught to do it. And if it's taboo to teach you to do it, you're not gonna learn to do it and you'll be widely perceived as an idiot which will be seen as you know, a racially positive outcome because you're demonstrating true black culture or something. I mean, again, the, the black right sees this as as ridiculous as most white Americans do. Not, not trying to jump on that bandwagon, just the idea that the kid who studies half as much could study twice as much and get better grades is sort of black conservative. Yeah. Um... I'm, you know, uh, I've, uh, I'm a frequent viewer of the Glenn Show with uh, Glenn Lowry and John McWhorter again. Um, I'm, I think uh, part of the reason why that show has been so widely viewed and, you know, acclaimed 
is that they it shows a a significant amount of disagreement and also you know mostly disagreement but some uh, mostly agreement but some disagreement between say a a conservative black conservative someone who's more identified with the republican wing and a liberal black black conservative someone who's more identified with the uh uh democratic party wing um glenn lowry and john mcwarry respectively and i wonder if uh i wonder if you can tell me what are some of the disagreements and debates that uh, those in 1776 1776 unites have in regards to this wide variety of issues mostly regarding to race and american history well i think that the two things that unite uh 1776 unites if you will are one a commitment to sort of honest scholarship where we might debate on twitter and have some fun this kind of thing but where we want to see people in the major public intellectual publications like commentary and certainly in academic journals kind of telling the truth so i mean that was the core issue with uh 1619 yeah i don't think there are any plagiarism level lies or anything like that but there are a lot of statements that are just factually obviously untrue like the revolutionary war was fought to preserve slavery i mean again it's, it's worth mentioning how nutty some of this stuff was <laughs> everything unique in the usa came out of black slavery um so we want to avoid that kind of thing and two i think we want to see black people and incidentally our white asian etc countrymen succeed so we focus on that classic black conservative model success sequence education so on uh, beyond that, I mean, there are almost total disagreements. Those are the two focuses of 1776. So, I mean, on, say, abortion or something like that, I mean, I would assume that you probably go across the, the entire spectrum. Mm -hmm. So, again, this, this is what's kind of weird about the Black conservative movement. It's a movement around this one point, which is that the 1960s NCAA, uh, NCAA, NAACP view of race relations, which Kendi and D'Angelo, Derek Bell, Richard Delgado, John Stefanczyk, so on, have jumped on two-footed is just wrong. Like if you eliminated, this is just one of the obvious provocative things you'll hear at a barber shop, black or white, but that, that is true. If you eliminated all racism tomorrow, you would see very little change in inner city slums. I mean, it's, it's just a clear, obvious point. Like there's an organized gang structure. People have become welfare dependent. Drugs are very present. This is also true in all white trailer parks, by the way, but it's just obviously true there. But absent racism, I mean, you might see some people get jobs that they'd previously been, they, they were right on that razor margin. They were denied because of prejudice, but you, you wouldn't see massive significant changes in the hood. I mean, if you're talking about current racism today. So in, the world where this is true, I mean, we ask, how can you actually fix problems? Other than that, there's not really any black conservative unity. I mean, positions on the war in Ukraine or something like that would be all across the board. Yeah, so uh, final question, since uh, we are approaching the end of our time. Uh, so reparations, uh, yes or no? Well, I, I think first you have to explain what that means. <laughs> to, a, to an international audience, uh, all right. So reparations, the idea of reparations payments in the USA is simply put, the idea that to compensate for slavery, the American government would give blacks, I mean, and that's generally the group that's being considered, a large amount of money. I mean, it's been estimated as $50,000, $53,000 per head of household. I mean, we'd work it out somehow, I imagine. But that is, that is reparations. We're giving black people money to compensate for historical race war, historical oppression. Um, I would suppose I'm against reparations. I, the main reason I'm against reparations is just that I'm tired of the government taking my tax money as a fairly successful man and using it for these bullshit spending programs. Um, I mean, we've already seen this under COVID-19. I mean, the Inflation Reduction Act is an $800 billion bill. So the USA is still a world power. I think we'll win the next round of confrontation with China. But I mean, you're, you're really talking about a country that's $27 trillion in debt. So I, I don't really think we need any more massive spending initiatives. It would be one thing also if reparations were just going to be giving me money. You would take $50,000 out of my check and you'd give me $60,000 tax-free. I, I can't imagine that's what it'll be. I imagine it would be payouts to identified Black community leaders like some of the ones we've been discussing with the diktat that they spend this administering projects looking at the history of Black America or that they 
use it to build facilities in black neighborhoods. I mean, I imagine the great black civil rights organizations would get quite a bundle. And recall that we recently saw Black Lives Matter get $11 billion in donations. This is The Economist, July 2021, absolutely mainstream. Nobody knows what they did with it. Um, I recently was curious enough that with the help of a research associate, um, I actually dug into the finances for one group, uh, Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, BLMGNF, and I found that they'd gotten almost 100 million and they'd given it mostly to a range of gay rights groups. So hmm. like, I mean, like, because again, Patrice Colors and these people were gay activists. Uh, hmm. They were not necessarily old school in the hood, black rights activists of the Bob Woodson variety. But uh, yeah, they, the money went to groups like uh, For the Guarals, the Transgender, quote unquote, Women's Travel Foundation. And as a black man reading through this, even on the right, it was just sort of, there's an element of kind of visceral disgust, nothing against the gay community at all, but just sort of like, the whole point of this was you guys were opposing police brutality. And I was kind of your opponent on the chessboard. But like, if you'd given this money to the moms of people shot by the police, okay, that, that's fine. But it wasn't. The money was given almost entirely to sort of upscale gay rights organizations. Uh, if you Google what happened to BLM's missing billions, you can find in a plug. My article on Spiked about this. I give a full list of them, link to documents. But I, I would imagine that reparations has a lot of potential for the same kind of chicanery. So one, I just don't want any more of my money taken until we start paying off this debt. But I think, two, there are very serious problems with reparations. I've seriously considered reparations before. I think reparations probably make more sense than affirmative action. But with reparations, you're running into three big problems. The first is who pays them, i.e. will Asian Americans who are currently, again, with, you know, as we've just discussed, taking probably more racial abuse than anyone else right now, are they going to have to pay reparations for black people? You came here from Cambodia in 1970, are you gonna to have to pay $53,000 out of your taxes over a period of four years? I mean, it really is that simple of a question. But I mean, what about white immigrants? You came here from Bosnia after, you know, black soldiers helped save your country from the Serb. You know, I mean, or do you pay? Um, what if you're descended from Civil War veterans? I mean, so you really, are we going to be DNA testing people is another question. Like if someone, if we decide to exempt Bosnian immigrants, and someone says they're a Bosnian immigrant, are we then going to ask how Bosnian are you? You look like a regular white guy to me. I mean, is it, what are there are some iffy questions down this road, let's just say. So one is who pays? A deeper variation on the same question is who gets? So again, we noted early in the conversation, 10 to 25% of blacks are from successful foreign countries like Nigeria and the Bahamas. Do they get reparations? Um, what about people like me who are very visibly, you know, 50, 60% Caucasian or native? I mean, and I'm also doing quite well. Do I get a bunch of free money? I guess I'll take it if it comes without the strings I mentioned, but I mean, just it's really, that's not all that fair. But again, these are, these are quite serious points. Like if 10% of blacks are interracial and 20% of blacks are foreign born, do we go through the black community and excise 30% of blacks and say, well, you don't qualify as someone who is black by this standard? Uh, and finally, who's next, I think is a good question. Because I mean, I would imagine if we pass reparations for black people, Native Americans, Irishmen, women, so on down the line would have some, some pretty stringent demands within a decade. You know, so these are, these are questions that at the very least we'd have to see answered before we consider it. But right now, I don't think another five trillion or whatever dollar package is what we need. That's the basic problem with the idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, I mentioned this because uh, I believe that still to this day, there are Vietnamese or Vietnamese based uh, NGOs that are asking the US of A, the United States to pay reparations for those who are affected in the Vietnam War, particularly those who, who have suffered defects upon uh, being, a, being exposed to Agent Orange. Uh, yeah, that is not something that you hear on the American news media very much, and not even Vietnamese news media, uh, surprisingly. Um, I find I find that even, and I follow John McWhorter's uh, line of argument when it comes to reparations in that he believes that it has already happened in the form of the Great Society program. Um, but... Uh, even if, so I base that on, you know, this argument regarding Vietnamese who have been uh, exposed to Agent Orange as such. 
in that even if uh, a large amount of money is being paid to, to uh, I guess, those affected, it may not have changed uh, their generation or the next generation's, uh, I guess, uh, economic outlook in the long run. And I think the same way as you give uh, a large amount of money to, I guess, affected peoples of slavery and Jim Crow and such, and you know, their economic outlook will not change much. And the only real solution is economic reform and development. There's you know, a lot of uh, foreign aid to Vietnam is dependent on the fact that we reform our economy to allow more foreign investment and a free-ish uh, market model. And so that is why, you know, that's why me and my generation, fewer and fewer of us uh, grew up in, in poverty, especially those living in urban areas like Hanoi. So that's my insight about that. And with that being said, uh, Wilfred Riley, thank you very much for uh, coming on the show once again. And I wish you and the 1619 Unites Project. 1776. Yeah, 1776, sorry. <laughs> as uh, much luck as you guys can get. And you know, do take care of yourself. And I wish you a great uh, new school year. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome.